well, I ran the script <laughs> and there was a, a typo in it. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah. So it didn't it didn't kill the application. It was still running. But let's just say one of the most important tables <laughs> was missing. <laughs> uh, like a fun one. Roger and I got to chat with Sean Stacy, who is a director of product management at Or Corporation and a brilliant database engineer. Sean pointed out that we currently stand at a crossroads in the technology market and our power to influence and shape the use of these emerging technologies. Unless you're in the sunset of your career, you are encouraged to seize this opportune moment and embrace transformative technologies such as Oracle's AI capabilities in the analytics engine. Sean assured us it would be beneficial to develop a deep understanding of business data and the analytical capabilities built into cloud infrastructures. This will give you the edge instead of worrying about your job disappearing. And as always, we got to chat about some of our mistakes. Oh my God, you're going gray. Oh yeah, look at that, man. Look, the gray beard right there. Yeah, look, look yeah. Look this one. When's the last time we saw you? It was- uh, A month ago. A couple months ago, East Coast Oracle Users Group, I saw you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I saw you at Blueprint as well. No. No, oh, I wasn't okay. there. I was uh, doing other things. Oh. Um, probably, I was, in, in all probability, I was probably working on my plane, working <laughs> on my boat, working on my motorcycle. Oh, nice. Working on the house. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. And you still, ha you still have that little Faraday bag I gave you for your phone? I sure do. I love those uh, things. Yeah, although I tested it and I was able to uh, receive a phone call when it was in there. You, and it was actually within the the both. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't as great as I wanted. <sighs> I'll look at. I'll look at more. I'll look at more. Yeah, and okay. I'll, I'll try, well, I have a really big phone. I have like um. I mean, look, look, look at it compared to my face. It's big, right? It's a yeah, it's huge. Yeah, the tablet, <laughs> <laughs> a phablet. A hey, tablet. All right, yeah, I'll I, look at I, some um, more. I was sailing last week, right? And uh, I came oh. back. I didn't shave on the boat, so I came back and I was like, you know what? I'm going to keep this beard for this uh, gray beard session. Uh -huh. I'm intentionally trying to look gray. So, uh, yeah, next yep. time you see me, I won't look this way. All right. Uh, you're going to be at Eco again, and uh, I guess it's December. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. All I right. Submitted anything, but yeah, I mean, I, I plan on it. Now I have a problem with the spelling of your name. No, that's my brother's. Right. No, no, my brother's name is Sean, um, and he spells it S H A W N. Okay. So every time I see S E A N, I want to go seen, and then I go oh, I no. Understand that. No, that's not right. It's Sean, and I have to correct myself. Yeah, uh, that's fine. I mean, people always ask me, "Oh, how do you spell it?" And to be honest, I don't mind how people spell it as long as they can pronounce it right. Right? I, as long as they're <laughs> talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> Life's yeah, too that, short, it, right? To be worried about that. Amen, brother. Oh, I learned a new trick. When you're having a gin and tonic during a Zoom call, at, yep. during work hours, put it in a teacup, okay, and yep. blow on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guarantee you mine is actually tea. It, it's decaffeinated tea, but it, it is tea. <laughs> if I was drinking anything, it would be a beer. I promise you. I'm a beer drinker. Well, you look I very think, healthy after your uh, sailing trip, so we'll have to get some uh, some stories for the sailing trip. But uh, oh yeah, the, what I'll do is I'll uh, I keep up this uh, splash screen, and I'll do the intro, and then I'll switch off of that, and then this way, when you speak, then uh, your image will show up. But uh, oh, and, and we have two, uh, three things we got to inform you of. Yep. One, anything you say can and will be twisted to be used against you. Perfect. 
<laughs> All right, Roger, you have yours. Oh, oh that's right. Um, the, the names have been changed to protect the innocent or the guilt. The, the guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so so how does this all work we'll be talking for how long hour well, but if we could go over yeah, we'll it, a little it, over it, it. It. yeah if you're good on time yeah i'm i'm good on time i'm semi-retired yep mm -hmm. well no i just see there's three of us so i assume this is being recorded and then it'll be posted is that how it works that's the third thing i wanted to tell you because i didn't know if it uh informed you when you logged on it records. It takes a little bit for it to save into the Zoom cloud. I download it. Okay. I bring it up in the editor and because I want to make sure, you know, we, Roger and I have been chatting and irrelevant information. Yep. All right. So I do a lot of trimming. If we say anything that is, will get us canceled. Yep. And it's typically me who <laughs> says something. No, never. <laughs> never, never. We will prune that out. Okay. Throw another shrimp on the Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dumb and dumber reference right there. <laughs> There's actually a movie, uh, Throw Another Shrimp on the Barbie, uh, set in Australia. Yeah. Well, that, that was in um, Dumb and Dumber. When um, one of the uh, Jim Carrey's character hears mm -hmm. that the lady's from Austria and <laughs> says, oh, throw another shrimp on the Barbie. <laughs> well, I, I, I get confused on the spelling of Austria and Australia. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm, I'm dyslexic. Oh, wow. All right. And so it's what I typically a database once, you know, with a, uh, <laughs> with a script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to give you my biggest F up of all time. And I oh, use yeah. it frequently. Um, Cause a large part of this is, you know, I, the young uns coming in, you know, you have to let them know it's okay to make mistakes. Right. Yep. And so we talk about some of our mistakes. My biggest mistake of all time is I took the entire State Department down. All right. Somebody gave me a script to run. Yep. And I ran it. And he said, you have to log on as a DBA to do run this. And this was 7.0, I think, or 7.1. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. And I go, okay, DBA, that's sis. <laughs> so I logged on as sys and I ran the script and it truncated all of the tables of the user user? That, that logged in. Oh, no. So it truncated all of sys's tables. Oh. And then all of a sudden the phone started ringing. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> wow. And it was a mission critical database and it was on a friday afternoon oh at least it was friday oh yeah but you want to know something places like uh oh, so the middle thinking. the middle east they their weekends start sunday monday yeah oh the weekend I, start then oh wow it's okay. sunday monday yeah so they work saturdays oh so i called the unix group and i said grab the tape all right, we are just going to restore the database. Yep. It's Friday afternoon. Call us Monday morning. Click and go oh, on. No. Oh, and I came in Monday and I remember my manager called me into his office and he said, your job is hanging by a thread. <laughs> And I go, I followed the senior DBA's directions. <laughs> I was very, I, I was young. He, I just followed his directions. And it taught me a very valuable lesson. Read the script. If I, read the script. Yeah. Know what it does before you run it. And yeah. if you don't understand, you ask questions. 
Yep. So if Roger gave me a script and I trust Roger implicitly, if you gave me a script, I trust you implicitly. I'm going to read it. I'm going to understand exactly what it does. And then I, if I don't, I'm going to pick up the phone, write an email, have a conversation, understand what happens. Yep. So how was your sailing trip? It was good. Yeah, I mean, we had, go? we had to bail. Uh, we sailed from, um, it basically I helped a friend get his boat um, up to Connecticut from South, from Charleston, South Carolina okay. to uh, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we had to bail on um, Tuesday. We, we ducked into Norfolk, your, almost your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. um, avoid that, that um, the gale force winds. There was a huge winds, yeah. Through. Yeah, but yeah. Had, yeah. I should be where I should be wearing one of my Mount Gay rum hats. Yeah. Hold on just a second. So you didn't actually have to physically bail the boat out, right? But you just had to go into port. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's got a nice pool table there. There we go. It was supposed to be his uh, his mother's uh, room, but uh, she did not move in, so he turned it into a pool table room. <laughs> nice. It's yep. a big room to have a pool table there. Um, it's yeah, it's a big room. So I used to race a J35. Oh wow. Awesome. You've done everything. I've done a lot of things. I have done a lot of things. And, and I'm still living. That's the shocking part. Absolutely. So this was Annapolis race week, I think oh, 2005. Yeah, Wow. Yeah, I've never raced a boat. Thank goodness. I, I, I'm more of a cruiser. You know, here's the thing. I wanted to be a cruiser. All right. And I figured the best way to learn, and I live near Annapolis. Yeah. The best way to learn how to cruise is to race. Absolutely. And so I called this guy and he was the COO of uh, TD Bank. Oh, wow. And he had a boat, Rebel Yell, J35. And he said, yeah, you can be rail meat. Oh, and so, uh, I, so I started off as rail meat. Yep. Then, I, then I worked the foredeck. Yep. I didn't go to Club Med, which, which we called the cockpit. <laughs> you know, they were just kicked back you have the tiller you know they're going or you know they're trimming a, a how you are uh, a line you know they're, they're just doing club med things you know we on the yeah. four deck we actually worked yeah no doubt well a couple of the guys but, i was well actually all three of them have sailed i have raced before and one of the guys was a sail trimmer he was a former sail maker mm -hmm. so I learned a lot from them but i i find trimming sails and really trying to tweak that last ounce of performance um a little nerve-wracking but maybe i need to get used to it because um you def it definitely makes a difference when you can get somewhere quicker oh yes oh yes but when you're in gale force winds you really need to know how to you know bring the sails in you know bring them back do everything that you can so you don't get a knockover. Yeah, yeah. We we double reefed everything, man. Well, triple reefed the jib. We still had a jib up, but yeah. um, we double reefed the main. But yeah, we were we were booking it. It was good. Yeah, yeah. We had a carbon fiber blade. All wow. right. And, and all of our sables were carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Joel would spend boatloads of money to make the boat go faster. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> wow. Oh, the old days. And then I stopped <laughs> racing when it stopped being fun. Yeah. I could you see know, that. I, yeah, it, it gets to a point where it's not fun. It is... Joel liked to yell. Yes. A lot. Yep. And That's a racing habit. It is a racing habit. And I remember he yelled at me one time. And the reason he yelled at me is he jibed without calling the jibe. Oh, no. Okay. Was it and an accidental or was it intentional? It was intentional. 
Oh, wow. It was intentional. Well, what he was doing was avoiding another boat that was coming in on, even though we had right away, we were calling starboard and it was going to be a collision. Yep. And so he jived, I'm on the foredeck and I'm standing up and I'm, I can't remember what the hell I was doing, but the deck was wet. Yep. He jibes and I go through the lifelines. I'm holding on to a stanchion. Oh my goodness. Trying to get, this is in the Chesapeake Bay yep. in October. Oh, Jesus. That water, and I'm in full foul weather gear yep. with no life jacket. Oh, wow. That stuff would sink you like a bomb. Yeah. But and he's weather. like, you're creating. Nope, oh, we lost him, Roger. Yeah, we lost our <laughs> our storytelling. And that was when I was like, <laughs> uh, you might have to, you might have to uh, edit that part out. Yeah, I, have to I, I, that I will edit that part out. <laughs> and that was the last time I raced with Joel. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, and I, I've known him for years. I still know him. You know, he's yeah. a brilliant banker. But he's not a nice human being. When not after saying, that. When he's racing. Yeah. When he's racing, he is not a nice human being. Yeah. And, you know, I find that. Um, and then that's the thing. When I've sailed with with racers, they're so stressful. Um, mm -hmm. because they yell. They're, yeah, they're very. Um, they, they just get it in their, their heads that they've got to go faster. And you're stopping them from going faster. I'm much more of a leisurely sailor. I mean, I'm willing to sail in rough conditions, but I'm not trying to make a race out of anything. Well, I've been on the Chesapeake Bay on a J35, which is 35 feet long, thinking yeah. I need a I need a bigger boat. Yep. <laughs> so. Yeah. It, <sighs> I love sailing, though. I love boating. I live on the water. Yeah. So. No, I haven't done everything. There, I have a few things on my list that I still want to do. So okay. now you're retired. You can do it. Semi-retired. 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 Really uh, working on my airplane. You may have noticed that I uh, I relabeled uh, Rob. He didn't. I didn't tell him about this in advance. But top muckety muck at Oracle Wizard. So. <laughs> I noticed that. Yeah, I'm no longer at Accenture. Oh, you're not? No. I didn't notice that. I thought, All right. oh, wow. First, I'm going to go like this. And when I'm done doing this, I'm going to, it's going to be a prune and a prune and edit break. <laughs> you want to know the funny story about Oracle Wizard? Yes. When I uh, first off, I had a boss when I was at Canon. And I was an IDMS programmer. Oh, boy. All right. And he called me into his office and said, you are now our Oracle wizard and made the sign of the cross. <laughs> I fought him tooth and nail. I'm like, Oracle will never be anywhere. This is Oracle four or five days, you know, yeah. mid 80s. I fought him tooth and nail. I still send them Christmas cards. Okay. All right. And the other thing is when I started my company, Oracle Wizard, I got a letter from Oracle Legal. You will kindly change your name. What? Okay. I was, uh, we're talking mid 90s. Okay. Yeah. You will, you will kindly change your name because this is a, you know, going on our copyright or trademark. I wrote a nice handwritten letter back to Oracle Legal, and it was handwritten. Put it in an envelope, send it. And it basically said, well, if you want to be difficult about this, I will t change my website, and it will be Oracle wizard on the oracle of delphi powered by microsoft <laughs> <laughs> i never heard a word from them again <laughs> but oracle
Oracle Wiz yeah. is pretty generic, right? I mean, unless you use the Oracle logo or something like that, I mean. It was probably some difficult individual within Oracle Legal who goes, we can't allow this. Hmm. <laughs> and I'm like going, you know, Oracle's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. I would not survive a legal battle. So I had to take a different tact. Wow. Right. <sighs> well, we never did get to the full intro for for Sean. Oh. We're, we're we're well we're well into it, but um, <clears throat> Sean, Sean, actually, probably what I want to do is just start or start with um, um, when you gave the keynote uh, address at the at the blueprint. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I was like really impressed with uh, with your keynote was that uh, you sort of set the stage for the need for the capability. So in other words, rather than just come out and talk about the Oracle capabilities, uh, you know, for data and AI and so forth, uh, you talked really about the need for, you know, companies to be embracing these uh, technologies and the changes in the environment and so forth. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit about, you know, what was going through your mind and so forth as you were putting together that keynote and so forth. Because I, I mean, I was very, I was very impressed by it. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and, and I guess one thing I, I want to say as well is everything I say is really uh, my own thoughts and opinions, and I in no way <laughs> represent Oracle, right? So just to indemni indemnify myself there. Um, yeah, so I was I was asked with coming up with a keynote conversation, and I mean, I find whenever I attend a keynote, <laughs> there's, there's some people that do an awesome job of telling a story and they just keep me engaged the whole way through, right? Like Rich Nemix of the world, that guy's a rock star. Um, and then sometimes you attend a keynote and they're, they're, they're not at all interesting. So I really sat down and I put a lot of effort into coming up with, with the story that I wanted to tell. And um, one of the things I, I'm really intrigued with right now is this whole web three approach to doing things, uh, the whole digital economy, and AI and chat GPT really fall right within the crosshairs of that, right? All, all the new innovations. And I really think it is something that is, is gonna not just change our industry, but change many industries moving forward. So I really wanted to talk about how that's changing technology as we know it. And chat GPT seems to be the, the technology in particular that's really um, gotten the most attention, but AI is in all shapes and forms, right? I mean, there's FSD that Tesla has with their fully self-driving cars. Um, there's AI in, in um, I mean, there's autonomous AI, right? Like, I mean, using Tesla or, or Elon as another example with his SpaceX, those fully autonomous boats that the components of their, their rockets land on in, in, at sea. Um, then Oracle obviously has the autonomous database, but I just see so many places where automation and, and intelligence are stepping in. And, um, and I, I saw someone, I, I follow a few podcasts and YouTube channels on, on technology. And one of the people I, I was following uh, threw up some information about, I don't know where he got his stats from, but they were jobs that were, most likely to be replaced by AI. Uh, so high school children, or high school children, I've got high school kids, high schoolers need to be aware of that, right, moving forward. And there's just a list of, of different careers and occupations that really stand a chance of being replaced. And it, it's kind of an, an, we're in an odd predicament in that in the past, it was always, um, labor style jobs or, or what we would traditionally call bl blue collar jobs that were being replaced by technology, right? I mean, my first job out of college, not my first job, but hey, it was my first job. Um, I was working for a telco in Australia. Actually, it was my second job. And we came in and we replaced the warehousing systems. And I mean, literal warehouses, right? Not warehouse as in data warehouse, but warehouse where the linesmen would come in and get their equipment and we were, were implementing barcodes and just automating their whole model for checking out equipment and parts and components, et cetera. And we were replacing these people's jobs. 
Um, and, but people were, were embracing it because it really made their lives easier. So it wasn't a negative thing. But long story short, what, what we're seeing now is there are white collar jobs that are definitely in the crosshairs of being replaced by this technology. Now, that's not to say that we all need to be scared and um, put our hands in the air and run for cover, right? Um, there are many ways that we can embrace this technology and take advantage of it. And really, that, that's what I, I want to, wanted to explain to everyone, that this is an opportunity to educate yourself. I mean, we're, we're, we also happen to be um, at the, the, that, that time in the market or in the space where it's completely a, a nascent technology and we have a say or we have some, we can control or influence how it gets implemented, right? And I think we can also perhaps benefit from it too, right? I mean, like all of us, we're gray beards. Every one, each, each of us have gray beards. We, we've seen, I mean, Rob, you mentioned IDMS, right? We, we've been there when this market or this technology space was, was evolving. And this is yet another evolution in, in, my, in my humble opinion. And really what, what I want people to be aware of is that, um, yeah, we may be, uh, some of us may be uh, at a sunset level of or sunset phase of our career. And maybe we're happy being the last one to turn the lights out, right? Um, till we retire. But if you're not in that, that category and you really do want to be at the cusp and uh, the leading edge, of our industry, there are so many opportunities that we could be taking advantage of. And that's really what I, I wanted to let everyone know. And Oracle's doing things that are definitely uh, embracing AI, right? So we've been, we've, we've had AI in the database for, for a very long time. In fact, sometimes Oracle invents or builds tech solutions that we don't realize there's a name for it when we build it. And then later it turns out that, oh yeah, that happens to be AI. And our AI algorithms, our, our analytics engine, right, is really that, a good example of that. Um, and it, 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 it has the deep learning, it has the machine learning. Um, we have the ability to uh, extend or augment the algorithms that are available for you. Uh, we have the autonomous database capabilities. Um, there's so many different directions we can go in. Now, one of the biggest things, and I hate to keep going on about this, but one of the big things that, that um, ChatGPT has brought to the forefront is this whole concept of really being able to freeform, ask a question and being able to tap into this wealth of information that's out there, mm -hmm. right? The, the large language models, right? LLMs. And that's something that, that Oracle is definitely on the forefront. So on, on that front, first of all, the computational power that, that runs those LLMs, it, NVIDIA is, is, is the new kid on the block that's really driving that innovation from a computational standpoint. Well, guess where NVIDIA's largest cloud footprint is? It's in Oracle's OCI, our Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. So that NVIDIA engine, that backend engine that these LLMs are running on, is running in Oracle's cloud. That's the first thing to keep in mind. The next thing to keep in mind is, is all of us are familiar with SQL and with structural languages to query and to analyze and to read data and to make heads or tails of it. Well, LLMs are changing that, right? Where you could write a sentence and it can come out with uh, a solution for you, whether it be a blog article or a document or even just a TLDR, right? Um, that, that's a whole new way of, of accessing your information. So, so during our last earnings announcement, Larry Ellison mentioned that, that we've partnered with a company called Cohere, I believe, C-O-H-E-R-E, -E, out of uh, Canada. And we, we've, we've uh, VC'd them, I believe. I, and I'm, I might be wrong there, but I, I know that we've partnered with them and they provide uh, LLM solutions to access uh, structured and unstructured data. Now, where, where Oracle has always blazed the trail has been in adapting and adopting these technologies as it relates to business and enterprise problems, right? We're not there to tell you about some social uh, networking problem or, or um, 
some influencer styles. Uh, we're not into solving those types of problems. We're into solving real business problems. So with our embracing or or working with Co here, and this is based on, on public information that I've read, and I can share the URLs with you if you're interested in it. I think Business Insider had an article um, that where we plan to, or where we intend to differentiate ourselves is, is you're probably aware Oracle has really driven a big stake in the ground as it relates to healthcare and the health, health services industry. So we're really looking at using these uh, LLMs against business data, against information that our, our customers store uh, their business data, but in a way that's completely private and secure, and this comes down to you, uh, Robert, at this point, where we're able to capitalize on the fact that you have a secure platform, you a very secure platform, you have business information, and now we have customer facing information. And I don't say customer as in Oracle's customer information. I mean, more as in the companies that use our platforms have their customer information that they can see in a private way and leverage these tools to access it. So rather than chat GPT and open AI using open source information, right? That, yeah, if it's in a blog page or if it's on Reddit or if it's on uh, Twitter, it's, it's uh, open access to everyone. That's not what where our sweet spot is. And that's not where we see um, where we can help businesses change their, or, or yeah, change the game for themselves, right? So that, that's really the, the story and, and, and what I see as being the new, new thing right now. The, the biggest thing that I think if you hit your, wa hitch your wagon to that space, um, there's plenty of runway for you, right? I mean, you, you, there, there's some huge opportunities um, as an individual who might be working in this space, as a company that may be supporting customers like uh, an SI, such as Accenture, um, or um, even a customer or a company that's running Oracle, whether they be a healthcare provider or a financial institution or anyone else that's, that's using our technology. So I, I think mm -hmm. it's a long-winded answer, but I really, it really does excite me to be honest. Well, uh, let me let me pick your brain a little bit more on that, if I can. Uh, I know uh, this topic has come up, uh, you know, in my company about. Uh, it seems like historically a lot of folks have separated the, I guess, the knowledge of or, um, you know, how to embrace the technologies or the infrastructure for AI and database as separate. <clears throat> but now we're starting to move towards uh, thinking about those infrastructure pieces together, right? And then what uh, cloud providers have, um, you know, that, uh, you know, what they bring to the table in terms of having uh, combined, uh, I guess, or integrated uh, infrastructures for AI and database. So uh, that's sort of a different angle to what you've already explained, but I was just wondering yes. if I could pick your brain a little bit about that. Yeah, if if I understand the question, so don't laugh at me if I answer it in a completely different way to what you're expecting to hear or hoping to hear, but we have a very good, a very robust platform. And, and to me, everything comes down to a, a term that we coined a while back called the converged database, right? And mm -hmm. the converged database is all about um, being able to access data in any format, right? Unstructured, structured, Avro files, ORC files, um, I mean, HDFS files, whether they're running inside uh, on a server that's local to the database, whether it's object storage, whether it's stored in an Oracle database or another cloud, right? It, 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 it really shouldn't matter. Um, and then by being able to access that data in a seamless fashion, um, we can, in certain situations, we can even access that data using similar technologies to uh, what we have in our Exadata platform, where we can push down the instructions and the SQL queries that the actual database engine to run local on those devices or on those uh, storage systems um, to, to really throw the smart scans, if you wish, the, the, the smart operations of just retrieving or optimizing the retrieval of the data. So, so we've got that, that end covered. So your data does not need to be in a relational database format. 
It does not need to be structured information. We can optimize the way we query that data. We don't have to just pull an entire file into an Oracle database and read it. Um, we can read that data at rest wherever it sits. And by the way, Rob, that data can be encrypted um, at rest. And we, we definitely and expect it in certain situations to be that way. But in using that data in that distributed manner, um, why would you care to access this through an Oracle database? Well, because we've got this whole wealth of um, the AI engines and algorithms that I mentioned before. Uh, we, we support uh, a, a notebook style of accessing your data and running those algorithms. They're extended to be uh, harnessed with Python, with R, um, even with SQL. Um, and we can do Onyx style uh, operations as well. Um, that data can be graph, can be uh, property graphs, can be um, ontologies, can be spatial information, can be document store. Um, so, so we can get to that information that way. We can leverage the algorithms. We can query it and supplement your uh, SQL style reporting or, or SQL built applications to leverage that data without having to physically move the data. Um, but in addition to all of that, we have a very rich data lake house platform. So one aspect to retrieving that data is to make heads and tails of it, right? To understand what, what you have in front of you. And we can catalog that data. Um, we have tools to help refine and to build uh, metadata information about your data to determine patterns of, uh, or cataloging really at the end of the day to, to understand what, the different data in these different data sources represents. Um, and then based on that, uh, we can also apply our, um, uh, our OML or AML. Now, OML is, is the one I will use. It's the same. When we talk about AML in Oracle, we don't mean anti-money laundering. We mean <laughs> automatic machine learning, right? So sometimes we'll refer to it as OML, Oracle machine learning, or automatic machine learning. And Automatic machine learning is about applying those algorithms against that data in an intelligent manner, but in a simplistic manner. So uh, you present the data that you've run through the catalog to organize and to understand that data. Um, and then we can then um, be able to, based on the patterns and, and the structures of that data, I mean, it's the data preparation aspect of it, right? That's a big part of, of uh, uh, data mining and data and data in, uh, AI, if you wish, um, we we can make uh, get better understanding or provide you, I should say, with a better understanding of that information, and we can give you uh, dials and knobs to uh, hyper tune, if you wish, or to perform uh, optimizations on that data and to provide re visual representations of that data using these different algorithms. We can also let you fine tune that those algorithms to determine which one suits whatever it is you're looking for. So perhaps you're looking for outliers or perhaps you're looking at um, predictive analytics and looking for outliers through, through that model. What better way to see that than some different form of visualization? So we provide all those tools. So are you, are you, saying, say, that, are you saying that it's, um, it will help pick the model for you based on the yes. characteristics of the data? Yes, and you can also then fine tune it to say, well, I care about the accuracy of the results I'm getting, um, and I'm willing to take five days to get the answer, or, um, you know, 99% accuracy is good enough, and I can get the answer in 30 seconds, right? So we give you those hyper tuning parameters to big, big knobs, if you wish to, to dial things in. And then, then one last thing that, that we've been working on, and uh, I, I can't believe I can't remember the, the, the name of the the technologies, but we're, we've been doing some, we've been in, working with a data sharing where we can see this data uh, across different uh, clouds and different object types or, or object structures, if you wish, third-party clouds um, using these open source technologies. So everything we're doing at Oracle to uh, embrace and to, to get, make the most of this information is based on open standards um, and it's open source. And we're not, we're not locking you into one way of solving your problems. We're really about trying to help you 
um, get the benefits of, of the information that, that, that you have. Now, I will point out there a good example um, is I'm working with, with a large American bank and they've been using um, Hadoop file systems for quite some time and they have probably petabytes of information and it worked really well for them initially, but they found that the reliability um, for the particular vendor that, and, and it's not a vendor problem, it's really the volume of data and the, the lack of optimizations that are available to them, but they've had some significant reliability problems with their data. So in providing this solution for them, they've been able to uh, leverage the technology that Oracle provides for them um, as they gradually move that data to a more safer location uh, to, to access it. Um, and in their case, they were initially running on premises. So they were able to uh, access the object storage libraries that we provide um, on their ZFS file systems. But ultimately they wanna move that data, and I say it's petabytes, um, into object storage. And with the success that they've had with working with the Oracle stack so far, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic they're going to use Oracle's object storage. There's no reason for them not to. Um, but if they chose to use another, or, uh, another cloud's object storage, whether it be S3, whether it be Google Big File, or as yours, uh, Blobs, that they can put it there as well. But, but I'm fairly optimistic they're, they're going to go with, with Oracle's uh, cloud object storage. I, I don't know if that answered your question, Roger. No, no, it's it's uh, it is interesting because uh, I remember um, at the keynote you did mention Auto ML, <clears throat> and I was uh, remembering that it was uh, helpful in uh, evaluating the characteristics of your data set and then suggesting the kinds of machine learning models that might uh, help for you know for doing further analysis. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. And yeah, and that's one of the things uh, when I talk to businesses, government entities, the salesperson goes in and says artificial intelligence, but there are so many different branches of it. You know, yep. you've got uh, auto, uh, you know, chat GPT, which generates output. You've got um, deep learning. You've got all of these different branches and to figure out what you need to do to solve your problem or to give you that little extra edge. Yep. The salesperson says artificial intelligence and their knowledge of it is kind of shallow. All right. Um, it's interesting. You brought up jobs. And this is something that interests me quite a bit. I actually wrote a uh, scientific paper that got published on the oh, wow. economics of uh, AI and the impact on jobs. And that was from a few years back. Mm -hmm. And my premise was that the only job that ever disappeared within the last hundred years was elevator operator. <laughs> okay. And even if you look at uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are still over 2000 telephone operators operating, oh. working within the United States. Wow. This was as of a few years ago. Yep. And the next part of it was as you pick a career path you may need to be retrained every five years. Yep. All right. The difficulty is going to be picking that next five-year path. You know, things are changing fast. Absolutely. You know, and it, it, it's kind of troubling, but it's also, you know, there's, I, I enjoy the challenge but not everybody enjoys the challenge. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, it's an exciting time as well, right? The flip side of it. Um, but yeah, it, to your point, one of my sons, I, I have three boys. One of my sons has chosen or decided that he wants to become a commercial pilot. He's going okay. to get a pilot's license. I know, I know that's right up your alley. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I've been watching a couple of things or following the industry, so to speak. 
And I believe it might be Airbus. I saw uh, something on YouTube, I think it was, where Airbus is, is working. Well, I, I shouldn't say it was Airbus, but it, it's someone out, someone out of Europe, France or uh, the UK. So that's why mm -hmm. I Airbus. Um, they're working on um, robot autopilots using AI to be one of, to be the right seat in an aircraft. Okay. Right? So they're, they're looking at addressing the, I guess there's a pilot shortage globally right now. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the way of innovating around that problem. Um, do, do you feel safe having <laughs> an AI bot as a co-pilot? Maybe, maybe not. Right. Um, but there, yeah. That's I a mean, good question. That right? is an absolutely great question. I'm sitting in a, a seat going from, let's just say Dubai back to Washington, DC. Yep. Who's in the front of the plane? Yep. All right. But then you take the next step beyond that. The Air Force has been installing AI in F-16s. Yep. And so they with flying the plane? With flying the plane and actually dogfighting against wow. humans. Yep. And that's it's a DARPA project. I love DARPA. Yeah. You know, if you if you're not familiar with DARPA, basically they say if you're not violating the laws of physics. We will give you a serious look. <laughs> and so, you know, they're flying, F F AI is flying F-16s in dogfights against humans and winning hands down. But then the next step to that is integrating the AI with the human. Yep. Because if you look at, you know, the sixth generation fighters that are coming out, they're looking at what the, a program called Loyal Wingman. And the loyal wingman is an AI flying a drone. Oh, yes. All right. And it is doing everything that that pilot needs to do. And the pilot will actually, you know, be in command of a swarm of a swarm, AI drones. Exactly. Of AI drones. Yeah. And it's to me, it's fascinating. Um, and I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. No, but it's, uh, it's interesting. But, but when businesses, when the salesperson says, we will make AI work for you, and my brain goes to the cloud is perfect for AI because when you build the models, you need to expand out your computational capacity. Yes. And then after you've built the model, you shrink down your computational capacity. So my brain is like going it, hybrid or multi-cloud is actually something people should be very familiar with. You know, you may have a data center running your applications and your, uh, your cloud hosting your data, building your AI models, or, and then another cloud doing whatever, you know, multi-cloud hybrid world. Yep. And it works beautifully, but if you don't understand what AI can deliver for you and all the different disciplines within it. You, you, you follow? It's not a question. It's more of a, it's a statement on my part. Yep. Um, you know, part of it is well, salesmen want us to make a sale. Well, yeah. And, and the other aspect to it too is the database footprint is evolving in where we can deploy it, right? So our next focus is on supporting uh, ARM-based processes. And part of that big push is because of the energy efficiencies of ARM. Mm -hmm. But it's also, um, it's a lot more uh, cost-effective to run across hundreds, if not thousands of these processes versus the traditional um, heavy-duty processes that, that a database would have traditionally run on. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that becomes more of that blending and, and it's following the path of exadata, right? Where it's hard, or it's difficult to delineate between the physical computational, uh, the physical hardware and the software layer, right? The Oracle database is so uh, interwoven with that platform. And I mean, speaking of exadata, we've got our X10M uh, just announced. Um, Yay. I'm sorry. Yay. Yeah, um, and 
I, 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 I know very little about it other than what, what I've, I've heard. So I've not really sat down and read any white papers. So I'm, I'm not trying to speak as though I, I know a lot about it. But yeah, I mean, that, that's the other direction that, that we're going, that uh, we are working at the silicon layer um, to make these innovations and these optimizations so that it means that as this AI world and these bots and everything else uh, the footprint of that evolves, we'll be there alongside it, right? And chatbots was something I, I failed to mention, but we we have a, a, a chatbot solution as well at Oracle that's part of our software as a service solutions. Um, and there's some, some uh, cool places where it's being used, right? For customer experience, um, for ticket sales, for um, yeah, CRM style uh, workloads, uh, we're we're using uh, chatbots in quite a few places, and then thinking of AI, we're also using AI for our support uh, operations in the cloud, um, where when we detect a problem, we mine AI is used to intelligently mine um, where these problems may have uh, occurred in the past to see um, to build an, an an engine to go against to determine if there's other ways that we can evolve or solve the problem without a human being even being involved, um, other than perhaps to give it its, their final blessings to say, yes, this does look like it will solve this solution we came up with before to solve this problem uh, is the same problem that we're having now that we can use that previous solution. Oh, and by the way, um, we can tell that this is going to impact impact everyone who's using a particular version of the software. So let's go ahead and apply it to all of their databases or all of their software footprints that are running in the cloud, right? So we're, we're using it in that way as well. It's self-healing in, in a sense. Uh, the chat bot, that's Grant Ronald's baby, right? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with, with that name, I apologize. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. He's a senior product manager at Oracle talk and chat bots oh interesting okay yeah yeah um, i'm sorry what was his name grant roberts grant ronald r-o-n-a-l-d r-o-n-a-l-d he's in the uk okay yeah he's he's like me he's been cursed with two first names <laughs> <laughs> at least his are both men's names <laughs> yeah <laughs> amen brother uh, now, Grant, Grant and I actually go back because he was a, I think he was the product manager of Oracle Forms oh, wow. back, back when it was, um, what's the word I want? Um, character based. I used it back then. Yeah. You're talking, you're talking about late, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Forms three. He's been with Oracle longer than larry <laughs> uh great guy um i'll send you his contact information sure um yeah, yeah absolutely brilliant um we probably have some bad stories to tell about some conferences but it would get us both canceled so i won't tell them <laughs> Um, so let, let's go back to the jobs. Now, our focus is always within the Oracle space, the Oracle professionals. Where do you see jobs changing, uh, morphing? Um, what's the other word I want? Uh, you know, just, you know, evolving. With the impact, evolving within the uh, context of AI. Yeah, um, I see, I, I guess that last example I used where we're doing the, the self-healing and we're using AI to to do error correction and, and debugging and fixing, for example, I really see um, the, the tedious tasks are being removed, right? Um, and experts such as Roger, who can fine tune a database by... Uh, tuning a couple of parameters here and there and really understanding how to dive into that 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 workload you're always going to need someone like that right i mean the, the, mm -hmm. that the expert expertise is is not going away what is going away is the mundane tasks 
right? I mean, you guys are, are old enough that I'm sure you remember uh, where you would size, or oh, what was a classic one? It used to be one of my interview questions where, okay, I've got a, a table and how do I sep how do I split that table acro across three physical disks, right? <laughs> and we would do that. We would play this alchemy style game where, okay, I've got three 100 megabyte disks. I've got a 200 megabyte table. I'm going to set the initial extent to be a size that's big enough that's going to force it to be spread across these disks. Oh, and now I need to put its indexes somewhere. Um, I'm going to uh, put the indexes for table A across these disks and the indexes for table B across those disks where table A happened to be sitting. We would play these silly games, right? To just get mm -hmm. the ounce of IO performance out there. And ASM got rid of that, right? First, it was mm -hmm. uh, Stripe and the same architecture, right? Stripe and mirror everything across RAID uh, 1 plus 0, 0 plus 1, depending on who you spoke to. And then ASM was really an automation of that. Um, rollback segments, right? Undo gets rid of that. Redo logs were, were a bit of a hassle. That, 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 that workload or problem has, has diminished significantly. There are tedious tasks that we used to spend a lot of time trying to solve and stay up at night addressing, right, as DBAs mm -hmm. that have now gone away to, to a large extent. And I really see the database going in that direction for people who manage and, and run the database. Now, I'm talking from the standpoint of a DBA, not a, develop, a developer, but we're really about providing the tools to take away those mundane tasks and the autonomous database is all about that right um, and then even from the security front rob we have data safe which is a cloud-based solution um, but it doesn't need to that doesn't mean that if you're running on premises you can't get the benefit from it right so mm -hmm. really it, it, it's capable of, of accessing or pinging your database it can provide um uh privilege analysis, it can provide uh, compliance checks, it can uh, provide baselines to tell if your database is, is skewing away from, um, if there's been some modifications that's making it less compliant than it needs to be, or whether or not it meets HIPAA compliance, mm -hmm. or uh, ISO compliance, or GDPR compliance, right? So, so those tools are making that job easier, um, so that someone doesn't have to spend all day running those operations and writing scripts and not sure, not being a completely uh, sure if they've addressed or there's something that their their dragnet hasn't hasn't caught. Um, DataSafe can help with with simplifying those tasks. And once again, oh, we lost Roger. Once Roger, again, where are you? Yeah, we've only got two participants. There but you go. Can, um, once again, take away the mundane and mm -hmm. allow that person to now focus on some new compliance that may be coming down the pipe or ensuring that other aspects of, of their database are meeting those security requirements. Hey, Roger, we lost. Hey, Roger, you're there. back. Yeah, it's really weird. My network all of a sudden just literally went away. It's like, got, and it's fiber. Huh. So oh, it just disappeared, done disappeared on me. <laughs> <laughs> Someone shown a flashlight at it. North Carolina. Your room looks really I, I, nice. Your office looks really nice, Roger. Oh, thank you. I built the cabinets myself, actually. So. Wow. How, how do you like my game room? I got to oh, clean some it. stuff off my pool table. Yeah, I love it. Mine um, is a virtual yeah, office. Yeah, I could tell because... Uh, my hair yeah. is red. Your yeah. hair, yeah, your hair does different things. Actually, since, gonna, we're, since we're bantering, I would, I just want to say, Sean. I mean, I was, I was th when you told me you were going uh, sailing last week. I'm thinking, okay, that's going to be like <sighs> gale force winds, small craft advisory, and all this stuff. And it was. There's going to be like rain and stuff like that, and you're going to be clinging on. And but you look healthy and you look relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I <laughs> actually, when I happening? heard sailing, I pictured. The martini <laughs> sitting on a lounge going, excuse me, but my I need more olives, please, as some <laughs> stewardess comes over and gives you olives. I like your um, version of it, Rob. Definitely. <laughs> I would have loved that. I, I'm going to give you a hint on the security thing, and this is something I've been playing with a long time. Talk to whomever you want to about it. All right. 
when you grant roles, roles can be hierarchical. Okay, a role can get a role, can get a role, can get a role, can get a grant, da, 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 da. and then you do privilege analysis on it, and you find people have multiple paths to the same object to do the same thing. Yep. All right, and, and I actually wrote something that would put it out on a graph, and you know, just like absolutely show you, so you can prune off the redundant access Wonderful. paths. All right. I don't know who you want to talk to about this, but this is something I see all the time. I'm going into semi-retirement. I'm not going to stress about it anymore. <laughs> Put it in somebody's lap who can actually make something work with it, such that you can run a privilege analysis and you say, this using audit and um, role, DBA tab proves, DBA role proves, from mm -hmm. audit to go, the person came in from this machine to access this on a select. There should be one path to do that, okay? But I've seen time and time again at customers, you see five or six different paths because they have other roles with other privileges. Yep, absolutely. And so you can prune those things and say, all right, this into this person type. Uh-oh, we lost him, Roger. Now, now Rob froze. <laughs> uh. Accounts receivable. Okay. To do the job, all right, and then do it with minimal privileges. All right. Yep. There's your next challenge. You might need to use artificial intelligence on it. I used graph database, graphing. Yeah, so, so we've done a, a couple of things, right, in, in 23C in particular. One is we've introduced a database developer role. Mm -hmm. Database developer role. And if you've used the autonomous database, we have data warehouse role. I think mm -hmm. DW role. So it's similar in construct where you grant a user DB developer role, and that mm -hmm. user or, or person receives create session, connect, and then access to the appropriate uh system object in order to write code or to mm -hmm. write an application um mm -hmm. but they they can query some system objects right that you would expect if you've got to look at dba objects or packages or whatever for for whatever they're they're running so it gives them the entry level privileges but it's all combined within this one role so that that's one thing we we've addressed um the other thing we, we've done is we allow you to, um, I'm trying to remember the exact uh, name of, of the, the feature, but if, if I had created an application and I schema level privileges, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So I could create an application and then grant you access to query it, right? Um, right. In order to do that, I would have to go in as Sean dot table one, table two, table three, grant select or grant any on, on that to, to Rob explicitly. And um, then you would have access. Perhaps my, my schema has a thousand objects in there. I'd have to explicitly grant you access to each one of those 1000 objects. Um, mm -hmm. You'd be good to go. Now, what happens if I do an update and I add another package or another table to it? I've now got to grant you that as well. Now, mm -hmm. what we can do is we can say, uh, grant select any table uh, on Sean's schema to Rob. And at that point, you now have access to my schema uh, for that select any table. Um, and I can revoke it as one command as well. And if I add an object or remove an object, I don't have to worry about the underlying uh, privileges associated with explicitly granting that as well. So, so we are doing some things to make it more usable. Um, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, but if you could take it to the next level. With the graph, right? Gr uh, uh, to me, my brain is like, show me a picture. Yes. And if I, and if I see five different ways of getting to something to, yep. to do the same task, four of them are un not needed. Yes. Yeah, well, and that, that's a good point. Graph and analytics on, on regular relational tables, right? Say again? Within Oracle, you can do graph analytics on regular relational tables. Am I right? Yes. Yes. 
Yes, you can. Yes, and, and I think I heard someone ask this actually at Blueprint um, uh, of our, our property graph PM. Mm -hmm. and, um, she mentioned that 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 was something that that had been done. So I wonder if it's been rolled into um, our data safe tool. I, 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 you know, it's a great idea and, and I, I'm going to make a note of that. I'll, I'll follow up because I'd like to see that as well. Okay. I, I, I would love to see that. I love the work that I did to graph it, but you know, I never took it to the next level to say, you know, if you have, you know, three roles and that are slightly tweaked, all right, with slightly different privileges, but they have the same, you know, that's one common privilege. Yep. Okay. How would you re-engineer those roles so this individual can do their job? All right. And the next individual can do their job. What was the purpose of the role initially? Can it go away entirely? Or do you need to create a whole new role set? Yes. But, but you're right. A picture's worth a thousand words in that situation, right? I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of like seeing the holes in the, in the firewall. It's yeah. no better way to patch it other than see them, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, I would love to see that. That way, when I fully retire, I can go out on the water and I can fish. I can go out <laughs> on my plane and not get, try not to get killed go out in the water and try not to get killed too. Yeah. <laughs> I went out in a small boat advisory because my wife wanted to go to this drive up or, or uh, dockside restaurant. Yeah. Crab cakes, dockside restaurant, Friday night. We're going. <laughs> Honey, it's a small boat advisory. I do have a Boston whaler, which is, you know, a, a decent unsinkable, boat. Right? <laughs> Un yeah, it's unsinkable, but man, we got wet. Yep. Yeah, unsinkable doesn't mean that you will that you won't sink. The boat will still <laughs> float upside down. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I love my Boston whaler. I saw a, a video of, of one where they chopped the front of it and they were still able to like motor along. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fabulous boat. Absolutely fat. Yeah, it was Jerry Seinfeld was talking about it in um mm -hmm in his cars and coffee or what, whatever his uh, comedians drinking. Oh, I forget what it is, but his, his show. Yeah. We, we, we should also do DBAs drinking. We'll do D gray beards and we'll, then we'll start DBAs drinking. What do you think, Roger? <laughs> Let's go for it. I don't know what, what the audience <laughs> would be for it, but uh, <laughs> I think we're kind of, kind of morphing a little bit. <clears throat> Uh, the Greybeard's uh, war stories to to be a little bit more technical rich, but uh, I did want to sort of pick your brain, Sean, for any war stories along the way. So like, you know, Rob said, when he crashed the database, I've, I've crashed databases as well, but uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's helpful. And like Rob said earlier, uh, we learn from these experiences, these bad, these bad things <laughs> happen. <laughs> Hope yeah. And they don't, and they don't happen very often. But uh, now, there, now, when we um, interviewed Kerry Osborne, he told us he never crashed a production system. So, <laughs> very, very few. I've, I've met very few DBAs who never actually crashed the database. But <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, I, when I was living in London, um, I was supporting a company. I, I was a consultant DBA, and the business. <laughs> Believe it or not, this business was like a, a storage company for uh, companies and government agencies. So Scotland Yard has to put away some evidence for a trial that's going on. They would roll up to this company and say, hold these, these goods for us, right? This is literally their business model. And the Oracle database, this is back in the early 90s. The Oracle database was basically a glorified spreadsheet to figure out where things were, right? It was literally building a multi-user spreadsheet. spreadsheet. Sorry? A multi-user multi multi-user, multi-dimensional, right? And much more efficient. So it was like building A and it was uh, aisle wherever, row this, shelf that. And it was a 3D representation of, of where this stuff was stored. So 
without the database, there was no way of knowing where things were. <laughs> kind of like uh, imagine Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're the final scene where they're putting the the ark the cover, the ark in in a crate and they're hiding it in this big warehouse. It's kind of like that. You have no idea where where anything is is stored in this this warehouse. Well, to um, the the what would you call it the operations uh center or where where um we sat the it people were literally in a fishbowl we sat in this uh building uh, in a room that had glass windows around us and all the people who were accessing and managing and performing all the operations i mean there's a whole crew of people who were responsible for filing information for querying information for coming up with invoices and billing and everything else was sitting around us so if the system ever slowed down or if there was ever a problem we'd literally have people standing there banging on the window <laughs> to let us know that, that things were going south and um we had a problem where in that case, we didn't crash the database, but we, we that's right, we did an upgrade and we went from a system that was the size of a, of a refrigerator to a system that could sit on your desktop, right? And this was a, a Sun server back in the day. And we figured out everything that we needed in terms of the software that we were going to be using for performing our upgrade. Uh, we were doing, when I, when I think back, um, it was such a foolish decision that that we made, but we upgraded the hardware, we upgraded the operating system, we upgraded the database in the span of like a three day weekend. <laughs> now, yeah, exactly. And um, we we kept going over our our plans of how we were going to perform this task, and everyone's we had war 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 game scenarios, right? How about this? How about that? And we just we realized, I think it was at three or four pm um, on the Friday before the cutoff date where we were going to perform this task, that there was one piece of critical software that we were using um, that was on a tape uh, that was at one of the company's other facilities. So we were in London, and the facility was in Cardiff, Wales. and Basically, we had to get someone to get that software out to us and someone rode a motorcycle with the tape in the back of their backpack to get mm -hmm. it to us. So we dodged that bullet. We were lucky to get that one um, by Saturday morning or whenever it was we needed uh, to install that, that piece of software. We did the cutover and um, initially we, 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 had, we hit problems where we had people banging on the windows but the, the biggest problem we had, and that one, we really dodged a bullet because that one, we had people who thought that the system wasn't working because the performance improvement, I mean, we went from an older version of the database to a newer version, but the performance improvement in the hardware was so significant that they would hit a, a window and it would they would see these windows appear uh, through Oracle reports, I think it was. No, uh, Oracle menus of, yeah, remember Forms had a menuing tool as well i think it was the Oracle. yes yeah, yeah they would navigate through the screens and the the people knew what the sequence of keystrokes would be so if they had to hit a key they would hit like e f enter enter space right so they knew beforehand what the keystrokes were going to be type ahead. Yeah, yeah yeah they would type ahead exactly well when the system cut over it was so fast that they weren't able to keep their keystrokes ahead of it and they thought the system was broken so that that one was was a fun one. I came to find out later um, that I don't know if it, it was someone else. I think that one of the guys assumed the role of the DBA when 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 I, I took off, and he did an RM minus RF in the wrong file <coughs> in the wrong subdirectory, and lost a fair bit of data. Um, but that one that that one wasn't a bad one. I but I did learn a few things from it. All the same, um, it was way too, um, way too big a job to do over the course of a weekend. Because yeah, when that system was down and it did go down from time to time, the whole company came to a grind and a standstill, and people were told that that yeah, go home. There's there's nothing you can do today, and customers and court trials and whatever would be put on. Um, I did do one so where where I ran a script, kind of like yours, Rob, but I was the, the idiot who wrote the script. 
um, where I was a, a consultant DBA and, and there was some table I wanted to optimize. There was something I needed to do with the table. I can't remember the gist of it, but I had my script set up so I could, um, it would run through one thing where it would copy the data from one, it would do a CTAS or something and create a table from the parent table, uh, drop that table and then do a CTAS the reverse so that I could reorganize and clean that, that underlying table. And it was an application that, that end users were on. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to lock them out for this short period of time that I do the CTAS, but no one will notice because it will run in a couple of minutes and their, their keyboards may freeze for a while while this thing's running. <laughs> well, I ran the script <laughs> and there was a, a typo in it. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah. So it didn't, it didn't kill the application. It was still running. But let's just say one of the most important tables <laughs> was missing. Uh, sounds like a fun one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've probably done something similar. <laughs> I had this one guy who was... Uh, a developer slash DBA slash ops person. He wanted to be more developer. He, he started ops. He wanted to be developer DBA. And he would write code. He would bring up production and he would sit there and pound code. And I would be like, no, please. We have a development instance, a test yep. instance, a sit instance, a production instance. Yep. Figure he goes, Well, I'm on the phone with a client and I have to figure this out. <laughs> and he always just drove me crazy. Then one day he comes up to me and goes, Robert, Oracle's not responding. Oh no. <laughs> and I'm going, What did you do? And he goes, Well, I wrote this query, but I for forgot to put a where clause in it. <laughs> oh no. Cartesian well, product. Can you say Cartesian product? Yeah. <laughs> Can you say Cartesian product on two tables that each had over several million rows? <laughs> well, I thought you were going to use an example like the one that I saw. I was working for a company and I didn't do this. It was someone else. But it was set up a similar system, right? You have one physical piece of hardware and you have multiple Oracle database instances running on it. And one of them happens to be the dev or the sandbox environment. Mm -hmm. and I forget the uh, you would run an Oracle in environment script that would set your environment and set the SID so that you would point to the appropriate database for the operation you needed to do. And this person chose the wrong instance. Oops. Yes. <laughs> I thought your example was going to be that one. No, no. I actually have this thing. If I bring it up in putty, red is production. Yep. Blue is test. Green is yes. dev. And I've been talking to Jeff Smith and I'm like, please just give me an option that when I click on my production instance, turn everything red. Yes. You know, give me red with white background. Just let yep. me select it. Yeah. That way I can go, do I really want to hit the button to say run? <laughs> yep. Well, and, and, you know, in, in, in those days we had uh, monochromatic monitors or consoles. So they were mm -hmm. either or green, um, mm -hmm. but they did exactly what you just said to make sure it didn't happen again. Um, the ops guys came up with some utility that would, make the borders like reverse inverse the font or something where it was very mm -hmm. obvious when you're on production when you ran that shell script um it changed mm -hmm. your whole terminal look and feel so you knew yeah. that okay, i'm in i'm in danger territory <laughs> but yeah, yeah they it's like from that one yeah if you see sweat dripping off my forehead before i hit run yeah you're you know it's like there's a reason for it <laughs> yep and I've learned all kinds of little tricks to make sure I do not do that in production. I've only lost production data once, but it was data dictionary information. 
the production data was there. You just couldn't access it. <laughs> yes. Wow. Wow. God, I love well, my job. For, yeah. One, one of the things for a long just, time. Just, yeah. We're, we're about to wrap up. I just wanted to say something real quick regarding um, a lot of the stuff Oracle, you know, with the OCI data catalog and the uh, auto ML and that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things that I, say a lot of times when i'm speaking publicly is uh talking to people about uh this concept of citizen data scientist right because um you know oftentimes dbas are separate from maybe the business knowledge right but if they but if they start you know learning or picking up you know the business knowledge and understanding of the uh, uh, the application domain and the data structure and all that stuff, then they can start sure. applying some of these uh, capabilities, um, you know, to to that, uh, you know, solving business problems. Absolutely. Including including a graph. I mean, I haven't done anything with graph um, uh, query language, but that sounds to me like really interesting, especially you know, like this use case that Rob brought up with uh, analyzing the network of <laughs> of. Uh, uh, uh i guess uh, routes to data yeah exactly yeah yeah and that that's a perfect uh, uh operation for for a property graph um one of the things that oracle database 23c introduces um is sql pgq so it's not pgql it's property graph query language blended with with uh the sql language and mm -hmm. it's not an oracle only feature it, it's been introduced in the ansi standard um, but Oracle's the first commercial uh, SQL engine that supports that syntax, and it gives you the best of both worlds. So it allows you to, uh, I mean, th th so there's nothing you, I wouldn't say nothing, but it's possible to do some pretty powerful things with with SQL, right, just on its own. And we can we can do the mapping of edges and vertices or nodes and vertices with SQL. But where, um, where PGQ or SQL PGQ really uh, showcases the, this, the improvement of using that construct or that syntax is when I'm looking at perhaps relationships between, okay, uh, me to Rob, that might take 10 lines of code. But then when I look at me to Rob to Roger, that's now going to take 30 lines of code. Or mm -hmm. it's an order of magnitude more, right? And right. It, it's kind of difficult to know where do you stop doing the 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 figuring out how many depths or degrees of separation, if you want to use that terminology, to figure out how far you need to traverse a tree. And with PGQ, because it's property graph, um, you don't have to, it's simply a case of saying, yeah, go to this depth. You specify it as a numeric value the same piece of code and it will navigate that, that tree and build a hierarchy for you much more efficiently. So we're, we're addressing that in a much nicer way. Um, but yeah, and getting back to your point, Roger, that, that's one way we can address it. But the, uh, you, I'm sure you both know Charlie Berger, who, who was a mm -hmm. former PM at, at Oracle for our data mining and our, our AI algorithms. He mentioned a couple of use cases around this whole citizen data scientist where he had some real world customers that he worked with, where the DBAs were tasked with grabbing the data and placing it into a format that the data scientists could leverage. And the DBAs were the ones who had to do the data preparation, the data cleansing, determine where that data was coming from and source the data in, in an appropriate uh, format that mapped to what the data scientists needed to perform their job. And what they what this person found was that once they um, once they would prepare this data for their data scientists in their team, uh, they then found that the data scientists were, were looking at using that data to perform a particular task. And this person then started learning that role and making that transition from being able to capture the data, prepare the data and present the data to then apply some algorithms was a huge leap. And that person quickly graduated to become a, a full-on data scientist within that company. And, and they're, they're a well-known company. And the point is that that person became even more valuable to the company than the pure data scientists 
because that person not only understood where those algorithms were and how to run them, but they also understood that, oh yeah, we're capturing this information from system X, Y, Z uh, that gets refreshed or gets obsoleted over this period of time. And this is the information we care about. So they may not have had the PhD in, in running these algorithms and, and writing the, the models to, to solve the problems, but the solution or the skills that they brought to the table were just as appreciated, if you wish, by the organization as a whole um, without being that pure Einstein scientist, so to speak. Um, they were still an extremely valuable person and they're able to, to step up into that role. So yeah, there, there's lots of opportunities um, and the citizen data scientist is, is a good one. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to be uh, respectful of your time. We're uh, uh, maybe about a half an hour over what we normally yeah. go, but um, we definitely appreciate you joining us and, and hope you enjoyed the, enjoyed the conversation as well. I did. I hope it was interesting for you. If you, I hope you think people will find it interesting is, is really what I mean to say. Well, I think the part about we discuss, we're discussing sailing was the most interesting. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> you that have to have a life. <laughs> yeah, I, when I was early in my career, I lived, ate, and breathed Oracle. Yep. Then I discovered, you know, when I was talking to my now wife, she had no interest in Oracle. And I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew other interest. <laughs> Sean, I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Next next time a gale blows you into uh Virginia or Maryland, just give me a call. Sure. All yeah, right. I might see you at East Coast because I submitted uh five or so abstracts to East Coast Oracle Conference. So we'll see. Oh, is it open right now? Uh, it's, yes, it's yes. Open, it's open until the beginning Ju of July, I think. Uh, July okay. 1, just a second. I will send you. Um, I, I will send you. Oracle I'll send you information on. East Coast Oracle Users Group. Yeah, I'll definitely submit some abstracts. Yeah, I love that conference. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll attend it even if I'm not a speaker because it's local to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, are, are either of you planning to attend Oracle Cloud World in Vegas? I actually uh, submitted just a single abstract and basically on SQL and analytics. Yep. So we'll see if it gets picked up. Okay. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I, I, I've not yet heard if, if I'm, if I'm going to be there. I, I, I was told that my name's been put forward, but I haven't heard anything yet. Mm -hmm. so we'll see. All right. Well, very good. Good. Good to see you again. Good touch base. I'm glad you came back, uh, looking healthy and <laughs> energized from your sailing trip. I kept that for you guys. With a little scruff. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. All so right. I found any, it. Would, would you like me to reach out to anyone else within Oracle? I mean, I don't. I know you don't want to just have Oracle people on on the call, but if you want to line someone up, let me know. Yeah, I'm 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 thinking of um, uh, SQL Maria and uh, Chris Saxton and uh, some others there in, in that yeah in that range and uh, I I think they'll respond yeah to we'll see how it goes uh, Jeff Smith's on my list too so we have oh a yeah list of some uh, Oracle folks Jeff Smith would oh. love to do it too he's a oh, yeah and Sarah Zimmerman Sarah Zimmerman okay Sarah Zimmerman huh. She's now product manager. I think it's in the analytics oh, nice. space at Oracle. Okay. Very cool. Brilliant, brilliant young lady. Yep. Okay. Yeah, but definitely, um, I, I definitely know um, any of the names that you mentioned other than Sir Zimmerman, but if you need a hand with them or if you want to just throw out that 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 I, I did one or they want to speak to me or anything, I'd be happy to to give you a plug okay uh you you're a good man sean hey man likewise <laughs> all right thank you brother right. yeah thanks right. for uh, looping me in i'm honored and and i had a great time right. and i thank love the gray beard yeah it's coming off the, tomorrow morning i'm warning you what
<laughs> okay. Until the next time. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.